All right, here we are at objective one, where you're going to be able to estimate limits both graphically and numerically. And if you take a look at the image here, we've got some somebody's holding a, a state-of-the-art brand new TI-84 plus calculator. And on the calculator screen, you can see a table of values. And the table of values, right there in the middle of it, you can see the number one kind of blacked out there. And then right across from it, the Y value, there's an error which um, implies that uh, that function value doesn't exist, is not defined at that particular value. But look at the x values. The x values are approaching the number one from either side, smaller than on the 0.9 side, and then bigger than on uh, the 1.001 side, okay? And now look at the y values. You set up your table like that so that you can see if the y values are approaching a particular number. What does it look like? It might be approaching. It looks like it's three, and that's the idea of a limit, and specifically that one is the numerical approximation of the limit. So speaking of limits, maybe we should define one. Kind of. All right, so you know how important crystal clear definitions, how dependent on them that we are in mathematics. So it's kind of strange that we're only informally defining a limit. There is a crystal clear formal definition for a limit. It's just it's not part of the AP curriculum. Let me, let me just take a second to just give you a sneak preview of what that looks like. Over here in Google, okay, 45 tabs. Where? Which one is it? It is this one. Okay. And brilliant.com. All right, so if I scroll down, so it's giving me some background. Hey, I don't want your newsletter or whatever it is. Okay, it's right there. And, uh, through the course of this, reading through this, you will probably see, see why this particular definition, though very rigorous, is not part of the AP curriculum. If you decide to continue your education in mathematics specifically, you might run across it. It looks like this. It's called the Epsilon Delta because of the, the uh, Greek letters there that are used within the definition. Let f of x be a function defined in an open interval around x sub naught. F, sub no, uh, f of x of naught does not have to be defined. We say that the limit of f of x as x approaches x of naught is L. For example, the limit as x approaches x sub naught of f of x is equal to L. If for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that for all x, the absolute value of the difference between x sub naught and x is less than delta, implies that the absolute value of the difference between f of x and the limit is less than epsilon. Totally clear, right? Yeah. Well, if you are interested in that, then uh, I'm going to allow Salman Khan to explain it to you. For the rest of us, though, we are just going to be satisfied with this informal definition of a limit, which goes like this. If f of x approaches a unique number l, as x approaches a from either side, then the limit of f of x as x approaches a is L. And then here is the notation, which can be read in a variety of different ways. Here's one way that it could be read. And it says the limit, that's the L-I-M part of it, of f of x as x approaches a is L. Now, all of those prepositional prepositional phrases are interchangeable. You can say, as x approaches a, the limit of f of x is l. Or I can say the limit as x approaches a of f of x is l. So it simply means this. It means as x gets really close to a particular number, then f of x is also getting really close to a particular number. And it is important to note that it is a unique number. We can't be approaching two different things. And as that formal definition pointed out, it doesn't matter if the function's not defined there or not. So that's the idea here. If you wanted to know what the function value is equal to, that's just good old algebra one. You, you plug it in and you work it out and you get it. But it's those instances when it's not defined, we want to know what is the graph doing around that point? And that's what this is saying. When evaluating the limit of f of x as x approaches a, we are concerned about 
how f of x is behaving around x equals a, but not necessarily at x equals a. In other words, it could be completely undefined at that point. That doesn't matter. Don't let that limit you in some kind of way of evaluating that limit. Your function does not have to be defined at that point in order for the limit to exist. So let's look at the, the three graphs that we have here. I'm going to switch over here to notability so I can actually write on it if I need to. So the first one, this graph A here, is the one that's straightforward. This is called a continuous graph. There's no holes, there's no gaps, there's no asymptotes. And as a matter of fact, f of a, we're assuming that this function's f, f of a is actually equal to l. This is a continuous graph, and the limit would also be equal to that l. The limit of f of x as x approaches this a value from either side would equal that function value of l. All right, look at that next picture. I'll zoom in just a little bit here so we can see it a little bit better. Notice that there is a little hole in the graph at x equals a, and so the function, well, is it defined there? It is because it took that little hole and dropped it down here. Think of it like this. Think of, uh, I made a poster for class and I put those little googly eyes on it. I glued them on there. I thought I'd glued them on there really, really well. But then when I got to school, one of the googly eyes just dropped down and then stuck down here. Man, so upset. But that's kind of what happened here. This function is still defined here. Here's what the function value is. Who knows, maybe it's like seven. But the rest of the graph doesn't look like seven. It looks like L. It's, it looks like it's approaching L from both sides. So that's perfectly okay. The value of the limit as X approaches A from either side of this function is equal to L. And then finally, this very last one here, this is where the function's not defined there at all. That googly eye, not only did it drop off, it's stuck to like the seat on your bus and, and maybe even onto your jeans, whatever. So it's not even on the graph anymore. It's gone completely. Function's undefined there. Doesn't matter, the rest of the graph seems to be approaching L from both sides and that limit still exists. Whoop, zoom. Let's come back over here for a second. Okay. So let me just kind of back it up a bit and kind of demonstrate to you that you have already talked about limits in a lot of your other math classes, but they've just been in disguise. One of the times that you were talking about limits indirectly was when you were talking about asymptotes and you first learned to graph those things. So here we have a rational function, f of x is equal to 3x plus 2 over x minus 1. I know that there is a vertical asymptote at 1, and there is a horizontal asymptote here at 3, and then I can draw my graph appropriately like so. All right, so one of the things that I could say about this is as x approaches infinity, f of x seems to be approaching 3. Does it ever get there? Does this graph ever get to 3? It doesn't. But the graph is getting closer and closer to 3 as x is approaching infinity. And so here's what the limit notation looks like for that. The limit as x approaches infinity of f of x is equal to 3. The function does not equal 3 ever, 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 but it's getting closer and closer to 3 as x gets, you know, further and further to the right. There was an instance. Well, here was another one, probably even before asymptotes. It was the in behavior of graphs. And uh, on this one, we have a cubic polynomial. This one's a disco dancer. Leading coefficient is negative, so it's going to point downwards, sort of like this. And so when you're referring to the in behavior, let's say we're talking about the end over here on the right-hand side. As x approaches positive infinity, as we go further and further to the right, f of x is going further and further down. It's approaching negative infinity. I can write this also as a limit, and it would be, the limit of f of x as x approaches infinity is equal to negative infinity. The function never equals negative infinity. This is just a fancy way, a very compact way of saying that the function, as my x's move to the right, my y's are shooting down towards negative infinity, okay? Maybe in your geometry class, maybe not, maybe on your own, you've uh, heard of or talked about these things called fractals. A fractal is a geometric shape that you make uh, by doing a particular geometric operation over and over again, and that's called 
an iteration. Every time you do it, it's an iteration. True fractals, you're supposed to do that iteration process, whatever it is, an infinite number of times. For this one, it takes an equilateral triangle. You connect the midpoints, and then you delete the middle triangle. It makes something that looks like a triforce. And then you're supposed to do that again and again in all the triangles that are left. And so this thing, this thing has got a special name. It's called the Sierpinski Triangle. The area of this Sierpinski Triangle is approaching zero as the number of iterations increases. So here's another limit notation for you. The limit of the area of that Sierpinski Triangle is going to equal zero as n approaches infinity. Does it ever equal zero? Mm, no, it's just going to get closer and closer to it. And lastly, we have a project that we did at the tail end of honors geometry about approximating the value of pi using Archimedes' method. And if you have forgotten, Archimedes was the first person to approximate pi as 3.14. And the way he did it was surrounding his circle with uh, polygons. He also put polygons on the inside so he could sandwich the value of pi in between something that was too big and something that was too small. So we can see from just this series of pictures that each successive polygon is getting closer and closer and closer to the circumference of the circle. And we were able to come up with a formula. And the more and more, the bigger the number of sides, the closer we would get to pi. So here is that formula. And in limit notation, as n approaches infinity, that n times tangent of 180, this is in degrees, unfortunately, over n, this thing is going to equal pi. Now, of course, uh, Archimedes certainly did not frame his stuff in terms of limits because they hadn't been discovered just yet. How are we going to evaluate our limits? Well, hopefully we're going to do them analytically, but before we understand how to do that, we're going to just approximate them two different ways. The first one is by looking at a graph. I'm just eyeballing it from the graph. And here's that opening activity here that I can say for the function sine x over x as x approaches zero from either the left or the right, that f of x seems to be approaching the number one. Now, technically speaking, this equal sign should be an approximately equal sign because I don't, I haven't proven that value. It just looks like that that's what it is. I have really good evidence to suggest that it's one. Likewise, I can look at a table of values. Instead of looking at a picture of the graph, I can look at numbers from that graph. Specifically, we would build that table in our graphing calculator. And I'll show you how to, in another video, build our own table instead of relying upon just the numbers that they auto-populate for us. But we can see the same thing happening here as as x approaches zero from both the positive side and the negative side, it looks like our y values here are approaching a particular number. In this case, it looks like it's approaching the number one, just like it was before. Okay, like I said, in the next video, we will break it down and take some specific examples and try to learn how to estimate those limits both numerically with a graph or with a table and graphically on our calculator.